What's up guys? In this video I'm going to discuss lobbying versus uh, street activism or just general advocacy. I'm going to discuss some of the similarities and the differences as well as uh, potential specific benefits or disadvantages of either forms of activism. So first, of course, both lobbying and advocacy are two different forms of activism. Their purpose is to actively fight for some kind of social cause or social movement. However, their actions and their audiences do differ. First, let's discuss lobbying. Now, a typical lobbyist's main goal is to influence politicians. So generally, they work with city council representatives, they work with their mayors and their state senators in order to have specific pieces of legislation passed. And besides just meeting with politicians, lobbyists also work with their constituents in order to garner public support about the specific legislation that they want to pass. So this would come in the form of speaking at schools, you know, working with businesses, it will come in the form of petitions, they might hold fundraising events, they might write letters to their politicians, or even get petitions signed all in an effort to influence the lawmakers. Now, I have a little bit of experience with lobbying, believe it or not. I'm very active in the animal rights community in my city. Several animal rights organizations in our city have proposed a traveling exotic animal humane ordinance, which would essentially ban the transportation of exotic animals in our city, i.e. ban the circus. Unfortunately, my city isn't too progressive in the area of animal rights, so as lobbyists, it's our job to garner public support, public statewide support, public citywide support, in order to have this ordinance passed. Specifically, we need five council representatives to vote in favor of this ordinance. I personally met with my own council representative, and I talked to him about the importance of sticking up for animals, the importance of animal welfare laws, as well as you know how animals are abused mentally and physically during public performance acts like the circus. I stressed to my own council representative that the best way to look out for these animals' needs is to ban their outright usage in all public performance acts. I've also written quite a few letters to different council representatives in my city, not just my own, but uh, you know saying the same thing that it's it's really important that we look out for animals and that this ordinance be passed. I also did quite a bit of lobbying when I worked for a campaign called Pen Environment. I worked on that campaign for about six weeks and what we did was largely canvassing. So I'd go to people's neighborhoods and we would um, basically solicit donations to our campaign and we would write letters to our state senators in particular. Uh, I've sent quite a few letters to him talking about the importance of fighting against Trump's environmental rollbacks. He wants to cut the EPA budget. We've talked about all this. Now there are a few legitimate criticisms of lobbying. Uh, most of this, most of these criticisms are directed at corporate lobbying where, you know, organizations will pay lobbyists money to try to uh, influence politicians and try to get them to, you know, pass laws that only benefit that specific corporation. A lot of the criticism is that they're just bribing, right? They're really just bribing these politicians into these decisions. And uh, this might be a legitimate criticism, but most of these people who are, you know, corporate lobbyists, they're not actually lobbying for a social cause. Whereas I was, when I worked with Penn Environment, we were not a corporation, we were a nonprofit, we weren't a for profit. We, all of the money that we got were from supporters. They were from, you know, constituents. They were from random people who just believed in our cause, who wanted to protect the environment. So most of the criticism of lobbying, you know, being just a way for people to persuade or bribe politicians into only benefiting them, most of them are from the corporate lobbyists who lobby, you know, for example, there are, there are people who work for fracking companies and for uh, coal mining and fossil fuel companies, and they do not want the EPA to regulate carbon emissions, for example. Obviously, these, you know, lobbyists wouldn't want their companies to be regulated by the EPA, so they would try to you know, have legislators and lawmakers try to establish laws that either, you know, cut the budget of the EPA or try to um, limit the power of the EPA. Now, this, this action doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't benefit me. It doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit the environment. That's for sure. It benefits these fracking companies and these coal companies. So in this sense, yes, these are fair criticisms. And it really is important to, you know, understand that most lobbyists are, they're lobbying for a social cause, right? You know, when I do lobbying, when I work with my politicians, I'm not taking them to dinner. I'm not buying them fancy things or giving them a lot of, you know, credit cards. So now let's talk about general advocacy or street activism. You know, how does this differ from lobbying? Well, general advocacy or, you know, street activism, it differs from lobbying in that its goal is to just influence, you know, public opinion. Many street activists argue that the real key to change lies not in the hands of the legislators, but in the hands of ordinary sheeple like you and me. They believe that those with the real power are the consumers, 
whom they can easily influence. So like lobbyists, many, you know, street activists and general advocates, they will speak at, you know, universities, they'll speak out at schools, they'll give presentations, but mainly, you know, where the difference is, is that they are known for organizing protests and marches and rallies and panel discussions, you know, much like the one that I had recently at my own university, which I moderated. I do run, you know, the animal rights organization at my own university, so I'm also a little bit experienced in the field of just general activism. It's also important to note that general street activists or advocates, they're not bound by the same politician's filter that lobbyists are, right? So if I'm meeting with my own council representative, I'm going to speak in a way that is very different from if I'm speaking to, you know, another college student. In fact, some activists will create intentionally, you know, profane or inflammatory methods of protest in order to shock, inform, and alert the masses. Yes, general activists might come across people in power like politicians or CEOs of corporations or presidents of universities, but for the most part, they're, like I said, they're just dealing with, you know, ordinary people. They're dealing with people like you and me who are going to class, you know, heading to work, coming back from, you know, an event of some sort, and so they're not really bound by that same, you know, political correctness shield that lobbyists are bound by, which once again is where you get the stereotype that lobbyists really aren't interested in, in you know, social justice issues or they're, you know, they're just bribers, and they're not bribers, but they, they have to speak in a way in, that appeals to their lawmakers. They're not trying to bribe or necessarily, they're not, they're not necessarily corrupt people. In terms of which one is more effective, there really isn't, either, neither one is more effective. I do believe that certain laws have to be passed. When it comes to animal rights and animal welfare laws, sometimes there has to be some kind of legislation to enforce regulation, right? I live near a particular university that is one of the best research facilities in the country, and they do test very frequently on animals. And it is important that we have some legislation that enforces, you know, the regulation of these animals in these laboratories. So in this sense, we do need lobbyists because lobbyists have to encourage the politicians. A lot of them don't care about animals, um, especially in my city. A lot of them are not, not that they hate animals or that they're against animal rights, but a lot of them don't really think twice about it. We need lobbyists to, you know, tell them we have to have these laws enforced. We also need to have a woke, quote unquote, population. We need people to, you know, realize that what they're doing is unethical and unnecessary. This is why I co-run the Earthlings Experience chapter in our university. So Earthlings Experience is pretty inflammatory. You know, we stand at Market Square and we show footage of animals being slaughtered. It's hard for me to watch as an ethical vegan. You know, I'm an activist and this is what I do. My goal of Earthlings is to, is to notice, it's to make people, you know, be aware. It's to shock them. That's the purpose of the video. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this was a pretty interesting video. I hope, this wasn't scripted at all, by the way, so... I hope I sounded a little bit more interested, and I generally know a little bit about politics, and I know a little bit about activism and lobbying, so I didn't really need to script this video, and I was able to film immediately. So, uh, I po if you want me to make more videos on these topics, I will definitely do so. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for watching. Uh, I should have a video coming up within probably about a week, and it's going to be on secular humanism. But uh, anyway, thanks so much, guys, for watching, and peace.